Uh, okay, so today, what do I want to talk about? We'll do a quick review of what we talked about last week. And as it says here, we're going to look at alternative consensus. And I might need to change this and just make it about proof of stake consensus. Um, but alternative or proof of stake, uh, we're talking about it after proof of work consensus. OK, so soft, soft intro and recap. What do we need for digital consensus? Right? Consensus means we're coming to agreement. Digital consensus means that either you know, people or nodes, and we can kind of use these terms interchangeably, need to come to agreement. So what do you need to come to an agreement, to come to an agreement digitally? If you all are out there designing a system, programming a system, you need two computers to come to agreement. What are you going to do? 51%. 51%? What 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 does that mean? Fifty one percent should all agree. So you, okay, so you're allowing up to forty nine percent to to disagree. Uh, is that that perhaps could be uh, inefficiency? Maybe, anyone, anyone else, what do we need? It could be anything, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin, right? You're right about 51% in Bitcoin. We call this the 51% attack. If you accumulate over half the hash power in the network, then you can start to play around a little bit and you can start to direct consensus in a way that perhaps other people no longer agree with. What about in general? If you think about transferring Humans coming to agreement to computers coming to agreement. What are you going to do? Rules. Yep, go on. That's it, just, just rules. Yeah, it depends on the scenario. All right, so it, it depends on the scenario, what type of rules will apply. Uh, and so I think that perfectly encapsulates what we need for consensus, right? We need some sort of rules. So. People have rules when they're coming to agreement. You have policies and procedures at, at corporations. Um, computers, if you're designing a system, you're going to put rules into the system, right? You're going to code it up. Perhaps your code is going to say, well, I need 51% of my nodes to come to agreement. Um, but we need, we need some sort of rules, right? And next, uh, this is, this is you know, what makes gameplay uh, enjoyable, is that we have rules that people are agreeing to when they get into it. Say it again, please. They have plus one, yep. so the fifty-one percent yep. is not a rule. Uh, that you're right. That it, that is not a rule. That's more of an outcome of looking at this style of system and then seeing how can we execute an attack or how can we go against the rules. Well, first of all, we have to collect all the nodes in agreement. How many do we need? It turns out we need a little bit over half. In a in a more traditional computing sense, we need, uh, we're allowed to have much fewer nodes in disagreement. So we need, um, and we need more, more, more nodes in agreement. So you're thinking like the 3M plus one rule says that you know, one third can be malicious. So two thirds need to be in agreement, yeah. Uh, and these are kind of computer science outcomes and you can, sort of sit down and work out the math, how many people can pass fraudulent messages in order so that we come to an agreement on the total system. So in distributed systems, we're answering this question. Who can propose the updates and how, how do we come to agreement? Uh, the who part is particularly important, right? Because you know what happens if one node, one system, one person is always the one that's uh, saying what is allowed as the next state update or saying what's allowed to happen next. Uh, and we would say, well, that's probably not very fair, you know, in some sort of like computer dictatorship. Um, we, don't, we don't really want this, even if it's our own closed system. We don't want an adversary to sneak into our system and then be able to take over as that sole dictator. So we still want to have some checks and balances if it's our own closed system. So Nakamoto consensus uses proof of work 
to decide who gets to do this. And so we've got some hashing competition going on here. And then in terms of agreement, what we're going to do is we're going to say the longest chain is the true chain. And that means that if we have any forks, that's OK. What the consensus mechanism is going to do is going to identify the longest chain and just build blocks onto that one. And in the unlikely scenario that we keep appending blocks onto like two or three branches, we're just relying on the nature of the probabilistic uh, system to be able to resolve that. And so what I mean by that is eventually a block's going to come in real quick, and that's going to be overwhelmingly the new longest chain, and the other chains will get abandoned, um, even if they've already started to be mined on. So longest chain is our rule for agreement. Trying to compare and contrast here to the social consensus. If we think about parliament, right, our agreement is some sort of majority, and that might be 51%, or you might need like a super majority in certain situations. Um, you know, perhaps if you're having a referendum, half isn't enough. You need more than half. That would be a rule that you're coding into the system, just like longest chain is a rule. I've lost my ledgers, but that's all right. So here we've got a fork, and someone's trying to double spend. They send me and Bob some coins, and the solution to this problem in Bitcoin is that I just have to wait. And so if I wait long enough, then I'm convinced that these 100 coins are in the true chain, and therefore I now have possession of them. If I don't wait long enough, you know, it's, there's a potential that Bob's chain is going to get longer and end up being the true source. And so we call these confirmations, um, but, but that can be quite slow, right? Six confirmations, if you're waiting an hour. I think I mentioned that this has now come down a little bit, but so, um, you know, a few years ago, sometimes the wallets would make you wait six confirmations before spending those coins. So if you have coins coming into your wallet and you want them to go out, then you have to wait that length of time before turning around and sending them again. It's sort, of, it's sort of picked up now that we're a bit more confident um, in this style of longest chain on Bitcoin. So even if a couple blocks come in here, it's unlikely that this one is going to catch up. And so this solves the double spend problem just by waiting. Uh, maybe the keyword there for today is probabilistic, and I'll come back to this. So that means that uh, you're never 100% sure that you can spend those coins. You can get really, really close, but you're never, let's say, uh, 100%. You can get close, like, you know, 99 point and have some fraction there. That's what we mean by probabilistic. Okay, so if we think about some other way for people to propose updates other than a hashing competition, um, again, come back to writing legislation, well, what you need is you need someone to put forward an idea. So you need someone to put forward an idea. And then the, what do they have to do, right? You have to, if you're a politician, or you have to run around and try to convince other people that your idea is the good one, right? You might also have to do this at work. If you are need, need some funding for various things, you have to run around and convince the right people that they should come in to agreement with yourself. Um, and again, the problem in a distributed network is that we want it to be fair, and that's going to encourage people to participate if it's fair. If we know the system's rigged, then we might just have to deal with it, or we might wait you know, and leave for an alternative system. So proof of stake as an alternative system, you know, it arose out of, one of the issues that arose out of was this idea of performance. So Bitcoin was slow, right? 10 minutes on average until the next block comes in. 10 minutes on average until waiting to see what's going to happen. And if you want more confirmations, maybe up to an hour. Sometimes blocks don't come in for like 40 or 50 minutes. And um, you know that that's going to happen, but you don't know when that's going to happen. And this is the nature of the distribution of block, um, block publishing. So proof of stake came in as a way to speed things up. 10 minutes was great, but it was looking like we could do this a lot faster. Uh, and then alternatively, at the same time, we were looking at the emergence of mining, and it was turning into quite big business. And people were thinking, well, there's got to be a better way to do this. 
or there's got to be another way to do this so that we're not buying all this hardware. So proof of stake, I mean, the idea is pretty simple, right? You have to put something at stake. In order for it to really be considered at stake, there has to be a risk of loss. So that means that the tokens have to have some value if you're putting them at stake, right? I'm happy to stake uh, you know, tokens on a test net because they don't really have any value and I'm like, you know, for educational purposes, right? Or I'm learning or something. But you know, if you're gonna stake in Ethereum, you're gonna need 32 ETH and one Ether is 1,800 US dollars right now, right? And so that's real money, real stake, real skin in the game. Uh, and so you need this, but in addition to the real value at stake, you need a risk of loss there, right? So put some money up, and of course, you know, like if uh, entrepreneurs know this, when they put up money into a business, if your business doesn't work, if no one buys your product, right, you're not getting that money back, right? That's the risk of loss that entrepreneurs are taking. They might, you know, even go into credit risk. Um, and so the risk needs to be here that your value you're putting in is going to, could, if you don't play by the rules, could be lost. Uh, and then at this point, we, we sort of don't want it to be leveraged, so, uh, in theory. Um, and these are, these are hard to do because these are rules that you're coding into the system, and then your blockchain goes live, and you're like, I did all the testing, I've got it, I've got it, this one is the one. And then this group of people come in and find like some weird setup or system of staking or redemptions or something that isn't how you intended. So you don't want that to be, uh, you don't want it to be gamed, and you also don't want people to be able to leverage it. So what do I mean by this? If I'm staking in Ethereum, I don't want people to be able to turn around and use that value staked to go take out a loan, right, and continue about their business. So you've got this sort of cycle. Now this is how banking works, okay? When you send the bank your money or when your paycheck gets deposited, right, your bank takes that, the bank takes that money and they reinvest it and they do other things with it, right? So this is called uh, rehypothecating. So we don't want this um, because that can cause um, that can cause unknown issues, second order effects, uh, and also you have less skin in the game, right? If you're allowed to just, um, we we see this happening. If you're allowed to stake your coins and then turn around and sell that stake to somebody else, or turn around and use that stake to take out a loan, right? Where's the skin that you had? Uh, how much um, stake do you have in that original system? So. I guess maybe straight away here, we can see that staking is a little bit more complex than proof of work, than plugging in a miner, and that's your hash rate, and you're going. Um, when you look up these definitions, right, it also says that you know, your rewards are in proportion to your stake. So if I have 10% staked, I should get 10% as an income from whatever return is generated. And so that's the fair part, is that just like your proportion of hash power can maybe earn you some Bitcoin if you have enough. Well, um, your proportion of stake, hopefully, is incentive enough uh, for you to participate in the system. OK, so this was happening shortly after, shortly, I mean, a couple of years, yeah, shortly after Bitcoin launched. Uh, so PureCoin was the first cryptocurrency to mention this idea of a proof of stake system. And they have like kind of a short, nice white paper so I will hand these out for you so you can get some, sometimes it's nice to get some paper rather than me saying you can click the thing online. Yeah, so it's nice and short, you know, six pages. Uh, you can tell that it wasn't, you know, written at a university, um, which, which is nice. Plain language clearly describes this concept of staking and what you need. And also as you go through it, you're going to uh, get a good idea of you know, how Bitcoin works and how this is going to be different from how Bitcoin works. Uh, so right here in the abstract, proof of stake is based on coin age and generated by each node via a hashing scheme bearing, bearing similarity to Bitcoins. Uh, so this is introducing a new concept called coin age. And if I go down to almost the bottom of the page there where it says coin age, if Bob received 10 coins from Alice and held for 90 days, then we just multiply them 90 times 10 to get 900 coin days of coin age. And so what this is doing is it's 
providing a new way to rank the participants such that someone at the top of the list is able to propose a block and earn some rewards. They're able to make the updates. Okay, so rather than having the hashing competition where you have to win the lottery here, we're gonna say, well, you know, you're rewarded for your time holding the coins, right? And presumably you can't do much to game that. There's like a universal timestamp here that we're checking against. Um, now what we're also going to do is we're gonna, in some of the details, we're gonna set a cap. So you can't just sit on your coins forever and then once you're at the top of the list, you can't dominate that way. Uh, and then also your coin days get destroyed once, once you use them. Uh, so kind of, a, kind of a nice, unique system here uh, to extend Bitcoin um, and also at the top there, they say it's a hybrid scheme. So there's still some proof of work involved, but not to the same extent. And you can you know, look up Peercoin, it's, it's still running. It's probably not the version it was 11 years ago here, but it's, it's still running. You can have a look and, uh, and see what you think. Uh, and so, I mean, that in itself is, is something interesting. Um, we have first look up proof of stake. We have a blockchain based on CoinAge, so that's new and it's still running. Okay, so 2014, 2013, there was a lot of research into proof of stake systems. So we see a couple blockchains hit in 2014, we see Next and BitShares, and these are not hybrid. These are just proof of stake chains, meaning that whatever stake of the total that you hold, that's your proportion in, in participating in the network. Uh, neither Next nor BitShares really took off. They still exist, you can look them up. Uh, they're still around. I think Next has rebranded. Uh, and then also around this time, we have Tendermint Protocol get published. So this is, uh, Tendermint's a research paper. Okay, so it's not a blockchain. But this one is quite important because now quite a few blockchains are based on this Tendermint protocol that was published. So there is a link in the notes to, uh, to Tendermint. And it's also quite actually quite accessible. Some of this distributed system stuff is not at all accessible and like, there's no way you would read it for, for leisure, um, but Tendermint's okay. So that was 2014. Fast forward to about a year later and Ethereum announced that they were also going to switch to proof of stake. So Ethereum started by, in order to bootstrap that network, they just copied Bitcoin. They were like, hey, we're, we're gonna do proof of work. They modified it a bit so that you didn't use the same proof of work algorithm. Uh, and then shortly after, you know, Ethereum, this is a, like I said, about 2015, they said, well, actually the intention is for Ethereum to transition to a proof of stake network. Uh, and it turned out to be incredibly difficult. So we're thinking like seven years of work went in for Ethereum to swap. And they did, they swapped last year, September, to uh, the event was called the merge. Quite a, if you were following blockchains at the time, quite a, quite a popular and unique event called the merge. So Ethereum says you're going to have to put up some stake to be a validator. So we're going to change the language, right? We don't have mining anymore, um, especially if we don't, especially if we want to steer away from those environmentalists that you know say that we can get along without mining, right? So we're going to call them validators, and a validator is going to do a couple things, just like the distinction between miners and nodes in Bitcoin. So a validator is gonna check all the blocks that come in, right? So a new block comes in the network, gets flooded, what do you have to do yet? You know, your, your node has to verify all the transactions, verify those state updates, uh, check those digital signatures, and so that's what a validator is doing. Uh, and then also we're gonna propose new blocks if chosen to do so. So this is, you know, the, the mining aspect of a Bitcoin node. If you are mining, it's the miner that gets to participate in that lottery. Whereas here, we're going to take all the validators, sort of pick a subset of validators, and then from that subset, so there's going to be a random selection of a subset. We'll see, there's a lot of validators. And then from that subset, uh, we're going to choose a leader to propose the next block, and that leader is going to earn the block rewards, which nowadays are just fees. Right, so the details here, I mean, these are, these are just details, but they are important if you're trying to like get the incentives in your system 
running so that people want to participate. And even if they're off by a little bit, right, someone's going to find the loophole, someone's going to game it, uh, or people just leave and say, no, nah, this other system is better. So validators, they better be chosen randomly, right? If it comes out that validators in North America get chosen more often than validators elsewhere, that's a problem in the network. Um, randomness in itself, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's a very interesting problem. How do you get computers to produce random numbers? Uh, so it's kind of a mathematical type of problem, whereas you know computers are very deterministic, ones and zeros, state updates type of thing. So how do you introduce some entropy to get out a random number? It's very very difficult and interesting problem. Um, and it's important here because you want people to know that it's random selection. Uh, I don't want someone to think that someone else is always getting picked over me. So it's approximately 1 over n, where n is the number of accounts that have 32 or more ether in them. So now it's a big number. Uh, 32 ETH is about a hundred grand New Zealand, just, on, just under that. So it's a big number. So the, the barrier to entry as a validator is very high right now. Um, when this was designed, though, the price of Ether in dollars was a lot less. So there's kind of that trade-off there. Um, anyway, that's how it's set. So you need 32 ETH to participate. But after that, if you stake 64 ETH, you don't get any advantage. So if you come in and you're uber wealthy or have access to a lot of coins, okay, you're limited. It's just the unit of 32 that counts. Now what you can do though is split. If you have 64, you split it into two validators, set it up so that you've got two running. That's perfectly acceptable, right? It's just like plugging in two miners. Uh, you're doubling your overall output, um, but you're not allowed to game it just based on the, uh, just based on the pure account number. Uh, I think I got one more here. Okay, so what's ETH earning right now? So as of present, this is about 0.07, just under $200 a block. Um, it's not so straightforward to calculate, like a block reward where you know you get a certain amount of coins. Um, you know, the devil's in the details. You can read about it on ethereum.org. EIP 1559, this happened last year as well, is the fee burning mechanism. So what's going on here is that for proof of work Ethereum, everyone running their GPUs, the total value of Ethereum was increasing, right? inflating. One of the criticisms about Ethereum was that oh, nobody knows how many total Ethereum there are. Nobody knows how many there's going to be in the future. Um, what's another one? Nobody, it, the rules could change at any time. And certainly there are valid criticisms there. Uh, so this proposal, EIP, is Ethereum Improvement Proposal. What it does is now half the fees that are paid that used to go to the miners get burnt. So you take half the extra, it's not extra ETH, but if I transact 100, I might have to set, say, one aside right for fees. Half of that one gets burnt, which means it gets sent to an account that you can't spend it from. So it, it gets, yeah, burnt. Um, and what this has done is we've kind of like, the, the total ETH was growing. And now it's kind of, in, and it peaked sort of earlier this year, and now it's kind of starting to decrease. So the total money in the system, if you consider ETH to be money, is starting to decrease. And so now Ethereum is a bit deflationary, which is you know, very, very unique. And um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it works out, right? These things are experiments. Um, but that's just a little bit about Ethereum's economics. The blocks in Ethereum are fast. They come every 12 seconds. So if we think about... Bitcoin every 600 seconds, right? We are like one and a half orders of magnitude better with Ethereum in terms of performance, outputting, raw transactions, updating the state every 12 seconds. It used to be about 13 or 14, but since the change to proof of stake, it's just determined every 12 seconds, uh, you have a new update. So I've got a link here. Let's have a look. Okay, so this is the contract stake your ETH. So if you want to participate, 
You need to send 32 ETH to this contract. You also need to do a, a little bit more in terms of running some software. But if we look at this, almost 28 million Ether, and then look at the value here. You can count the commas, right? Uh, 51 billion dollars in value at $1,800 in ETH. So, you know, this one smart contract, very important one, it's sort of managing this amount of value in the network, right? It's not necessarily holding it like a bank. There's, you can't really make that distinction here. Um, but in this one spot, you can go in and you can look and you can see the value online. You can see the numbers. You can see who has contributed. It's all right there. $51 billion. Uh, and so I have another graph here that I will show us. Let's see. This is as good as any. Uh, showing the balance. And if we look at the blue line, not the black line. So the blue line is the balance based in ETH instead of US dollars, right? But in the last two years since you've been able to stake, it's just gone up. And so this is kind of like a proxy for people's either belief in the network or a proxy for network health, right? Or for the fact that people see value here. And by that, I mean deposit some ETH and earn some in return, right? This is, this is an asset. This is an income generating asset for you. You deposit some ETH and you get, um, I don't know what the percentage is, are right now, but there are probably like five, six, seven, eight percent is your return from being a validator. Okay, so we have to have uh, something at stake here, right? So something if 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 you're not playing by the rules, then we need some way uh, to incentivize you to change your mind and play by the rules. So this is called slashing. And basically just incentivizes honest behavior. And so this is just from another website called beaconchain.in, Beacon Chain. And what you can see here is kind of like, now, you know, this is just a third party has made this, has made this. But what I think is interesting is that you can see like the smiley face here, right? 100% perfect. So we're like putting human emotions on here. We can see like some treasure that they've, that they've won. We got stars in our eyes, um, and so we can. Let's look at this link as well. Oh no, they've gone down. So since I posted that screenshot, they're only 99% good. Oh, there's no stars in the eyes anymore. Okay, so you can read there. The attestation inclusion effectiveness should be 80% or higher to minimize reward penalties. Um, and we can see here a balance, so 32 and the 0 .032 would be earned from, from fees from participating. And so every so often you're going to withdraw your income. Down here they've proposed three blocks. Down here, so attestation, this is just like voting. So you're saying, yep, that behavior looks good. Uh, and so part of this is that if you want to be a validator, you need to commit your computer to being online. Uh, so you need to have good internet connection, right? You need to have good enough hardware to run the software. And you gotta leave it running, right? You can't validate transactions when you turn off the computer at night. That's, that's no good. So that's part of what this is in terms of like uptime. If you wanna participate in a global network, well, it better be turned on. But I mean, this part I find interesting because it kind of seems like there's like a social credit score that's attached here to like your Ethereum uh, validators. Now again, it's just coded up by this third party website. But um, I haven't looked too much into slashing penalties, but if you don't play by the rules, what happens is your balance is going to decrease, and then you're going to have like a fixed amount of time for you to pull your contract. Uh, and so this is an important part about these systems is that you're free to join, which is great, but you're also free to leave, right? So um, often maybe underrepresented is this freedom to exit a system. And we think about like big tech, and like social media, right? We get locked into one system. And you're like, oh, can I really leave if everybody else is also there doing the same thing? If all my customers are also there, I need to be there too. So we think, is there really the freedom to exit? Uh, and so if you have bad behavior, you can exit. Uh, I don't think your whole stake doesn't go away, right? There's some sort of proportional penalty. 
but you can exit, and then you can top up and rejoin, but you'll have to join the queue again. So you won't be allowed to go straight in. Here's sort of a similar graph. I just said validators go up. Uh, and like if you look at this, right, like if you presented this graph and said like, look, these are the customers that are using my product, right? That looks tr tr tremendous. Pretty stable, pretty solid four, five, six X growth, right, in a couple of years. Um, not really, not really any dips. So this is how many validators there are. I didn't catch the peak there, but there's over, there's like 700,000 validators in Ethereum. Now they're not, that's not 700,000 people or entities, right? That's 700,000 groups of 32 Ether participating as validators. So a, a, a distinction there, um, I do tend to talk a lot about nodes as the same as people to maybe personify it, but you know, these validators, multiple people are running multiple validators. And there's also a business now, if you don't have 32 ETH, you can contribute a fraction, join up with others, right? Pool your resources, and then go earn a proportion of the rewards. Um, so that's uh, pooling in Ethereum. Okay, any questions so far, any comments so far? So I think what I want to do next, so we've had like, you know, three and a half weeks in, I think now we're ready to like write down what is a blockchain or to pose a definition of a blockchain. Taking in sort of what we know. So I'll use this board here and then maybe I will go down there. Okay, so what is a blockchain? Ah, distributed system, okay. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be open, but we're gonna assume, we're gonna assume open. The closed ones get a little bit weird when you start trying to like define them and try to like map the characteristics over. So maybe I'll say open so that you can join and leave. And then if we think about the purpose of having this, you know, cumbersome linked list and uh, all these different ways for incentives to come about, uh, we think about, well, what's it really doing at the end of the day? All it's doing is maintaining like that ledger order. It's just saying who did what, when. And so we're gonna say it needs to maintain a total order needs to, that maintains a totally ordered ledger. And without putting too many words, we can stop there. Ledger, you could store any data you want, but you need that total ordering to it. Distributed system or architecture that maintains totally ordered ledger. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about two properties. So the first one, I'm gonna do like a tree here. So the first one is gonna be strong civil resistance. Civil comes from a psychology case about someone with multiple personalities. So a civil attack or a, a civil threat in computing is this idea that we don't know who you are and you can split your identity or you can control C, control V, your identity, and you can pretend to be multiple entities or attackers at the same time. So that's a civil attack commonly seen in uh, denial of service, you know, where it's not a bunch of individual people asking the website for resources, but it's one person who then creates a bunch of identities that all spam the web server. So what we want is strong civil resistance. We don't want somebody to be able to say, okay, I've got 32 ETH here, maybe I can lever it, create another 32 ETH, join the network again, and do that on repeat, you know, maybe some, something like this. Um, and that would be civil resistance. Now, if you have a closed system, then you're gonna have some policies and tools to identify and prevent DDoS attacks, things like this. In an open system though, right, we don't know who the people are that are coming and going. Okay, so we've talked about proof of work. How does proof of work 
do this civil resistance? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, no matter who you are, you have to contribute work. You have to uh, run your miners if you want to try to gain the system. And so the, the penalty or the incentive here uh, is clock cycles on your miners. And then you know you have to pay for the hardware and the electricity. And so if you try to attack the a proof of work network, hopefully you end up just wasting money. Right? And then you know that's going to teach you a lesson. And next time around, you're going to say, well, why don't we just join a mining pool and earn the Bitcoin and you know go to lunch? So that's the idea of the incentive mechanism there, strong civil resistance. So that's proof of work. So my other broad category here, proof of stake, that we've talked about today, well, we need some penalty if you're trying to attack the system. So one thing you can do in Ethereum is try to propose two blocks at the same time. Um, and then in those two blocks, you might you know, have some, some double spend transaction or something like this. Uh, and the incentive here is going to be slashing. Um, uh, the stick here is going to be slashing. And the bit that you're trying to capitalize on here is no longer clock cycles. Right, in Ethereum, we're saying this is tokens. So you have a certain number of tokens or ether as your stake in the system. You have a certain amount of hash or clock cycles for, uh, for Bitcoin. Okay, so strong civil resistance, first property. Second property our blockchain needs is a fork choice rule. So when the network naturally is going to fork because of uh, you know latency, latency, because of the random nature of proof of work where someone finds a block faster or two people find one at the same time, we need a way for the network to resolve these issues, and it should happen on its own automatically in the background. Um, and it shouldn't cause us you know, too much long-term, it shouldn't cause us any headaches. Uh, OK, so two styles we're going to use here. The Bitcoin style is longest chain fork choice rule. So we've seen this a few times now. And I've also mentioned this word a bunch. This is probabilistic. In nature, so longest chain. So when we couple these properties together, we could use these two proof of work and longest chain and come up with Bitcoin. Okay, so what's proof of stake doing? Well, we're gonna say that this is I like the word committee because it think of like people at the round table making decisions. Um, we could also say that this is Uh, Byzantine fault tolerant type of system. So BFT comes from the old distributed systems literature uh, with algorithms that we know work for this type of thing. So BFT style fork choice rule um, is going to you know apply specifically to blockchains. And how are people going to come to an agreement on what state to update, what to what block to include next? Uh, and so this one now, it's not probabilistic, this one
is deterministic. And so here we see a difference between the two. Probabilistic and longest chain. In the early days, we didn't think that this was going to work out very well because of this nature. Uh, this one is deterministic, and people like this because in Ethereum now, you just have to wait until the next epic. I think it's two epics, so it's just a couple minutes. You have to wait until you're sure that that transaction is finalized. And that's called deterministic. So as soon as there's an update that gets pushed to the chain, you know, okay, we're good to go. There won't be any future changes after that. And so that's why people like this idea of uh, deterministic style. So there's two properties here that I will just mention quickly that a distributed system needs to operate. So one is called liveness and one is called safety. Uh, the liveness is just as it sounds. It says, is your network going to stay alive? And if we think about Bitcoin or a longest chain probabilistic, nobody has to ask, you don't have to ask anyone to update the chain. All you need to do is meet the requirements, like the hashing requirements, and then you can publish a block. Uh, and in this sense, you might have to wait a while to find the block, but eventually you're going to get one. And so longest chain preserves liveness. You don't have a problem with the state stalling Compared to BFT style, liveness is an issue with these ones because what you're doing in a committee is you're waiting for everyone to send their votes in. And if one of those votes doesn't come in, one of those messengers falls off his horse, then we could be waiting quite a while. And we don't know if that vote's ever going to come in. Your network can stall. Okay, and so, I mean, that's a bad thing. And in, in, you, you code ways around this. You have additional rules to get around this. But essentially, there's this property called liveness that is violated in this deterministic style. And the way around it is just to have what's called a timeout. So you say, well, if Jeff doesn't come back you know, by 6 o'clock, we're just going to do it without him. So in here, we need a clock or a timeout. Uh, and the point of showing these two properties is to get an idea of the different characteristics that your different blockchains are going to present and the different areas in the design space. Uh, the next one is called safety. Uh, and safety means, did somebody, um, did somebody disagree with what I have to say? Uh, so if we're in agreement, everyone votes the same way. We say, yep, that transaction is good. That's called safe or consistent. And that's what we want. We want our state updates to be nice and consistent. Um, and the deterministic style here is very good at safety. Uh, and that's because everyone sits around. And in order to advance, you have to agree on the state. Okay, So when you have state n plus 1, deterministic style, everyone, you know, based on the agreement process, um, is voting the same way. But in longest chain style, as we've seen, forking is um, expected behavior. And if you have two forks, well, straight away you have violation. Those two forks are voting on different groupings of transactions. And so longest chain violates this idea of safety. So these two properties, liveness and safety from distributed systems, can give us a more fine-grained appreciation of the different design principles in, in a blockchain. Um, but I think I think that's a pretty solid, like, short-ish definition. So we got like a distributed system. It's open. It maintains total order. Has strong civil resistance, and has some fork choice rule. And we can kind of like mix and match these to see the different options. OK, so speaking of mixing and matching, yeah, come in. Yeah, oh, there you go. Have a good night. You're all good. OK, so 
putting up a little two by two matrix here. So we got proof of work, proof of stake, longest chain, and BFT style. Uh, so if we look at this, we can sort of um, picture the landscape of where we're at with blockchains. So proof of work, longest chain, Uh, so we're thinking Bitcoin, Dogecoin, uh, Litecoin, and any number, uh, Bitcoin Cash, any number of forks of Bitcoin. All those I mentioned are all forks of Bitcoin. Uh, so they all use proof of work, longest chain style in order to achieve consensus or for a combo of civil resistance and fork choice rule. Uh, and then over here, Proof of stake and BFT styles in this quadrant. So the big one is Ethereum. Uh, and there's many, many other layer ones, as they're called. You know, Bitcoin is also a layer one. We haven't really talked about the layering yet. Uh, I think next week we have scaling. And so we'll talk about how blockchains can scale. Um, but so we have Ethereum. Uh, and we have lots of others. To name a couple, Algorand and Solana, these are all proof of stake style. Now, when you go to the websites and read about them, you know, they're all like advertising, they're little bits where they're different than the other one. But, you know, of course, of course, they're going to tell you why uh, Solana is the one, right, to bring your business business to, um, which it, which is kind of weird when you think about like a distributed open system. But that's that's how it goes. Um, and then, okay, so we got two other quadrants in here, and these are the kind of weird ones. So for longest chain proof of stake, uh, there's only a couple. So Cardano is one that's based on this, and it runs a mechanism called Ouroboros. The name's not important, it's just the name of the consensus algorithm. So Cardano runs this one, and it has, like we said, a longest chain fork choice rule, but it has a proof of stake there. Cardano's founder was a co-founder of Ethereum, just uh, if you get into some of the blockchain dramas, um, sort of like watching, you know, the real founders of blockchain, um, all of, obviously we don't know anything about Bitcoin's founder, but uh, Ethereum, Cardano, and the next one I'm going to write is Polkadot. Polkadot's founder also was a co-founder of Ethereum. And so you can kind of see what's going on here, right? Um, so Polkadot and Cardano, I mean, Polkadot has, Polkadot has some usage, usage. It kind of has a, Polkadot's like a federation of blockchains altogether. Um, I forget exactly what they call them, parachains maybe, something like that. And so Polkadot seems to be kind of unique. Cardano... I would steer clear of Cardano. It seems like a bit of a wasteland. There's not really much activity happening there. Um, anyways, that's, that's neither here nor there. What they're doing is longest chain style. Uh, Ethereum, Algorand, Solana. I mean, I guess I could go on. Anything with Tendermint. I mentioned Tendermint earlier. Tendermint BFT style consensus. Anything with Tendermint probably goes goes in here. And then we have and then we have this quadrant and nothing really fits or works out in this quadrant. If you have proof of work civil mechanism with BFT fork choice rule. Nothing really nothing really works here. Um, one of the reasons is that you end up your you end up violating both those conditions back there, liveness and safety. Uh, another reason you could imagine is that you end up with too many forks of your network. 
So proof of work, I don't really know how I'm going to draw this, but it's possible because of this longest chain style, and it's possible if your parameters aren't quite right that your network could just fork indefinitely. And you just have too many forks, and then you can't tell which one's the longest chain anymore, and the network's going to stall because you have too many nodes trying to collect all these different messages. So that is a possibility of like a way that blockchains can die. You know, if a way that networks can die if they're not designed well. So one of the things Bitcoin does to handle this is Bitcoin waits. And it makes you wait, uh, you know, by design 10 minutes for the next block. And that lets everyone catch up, organize their paperwork, look at all the transactions, validate them and say, okay, I'm ready to go again. So it, lots and lots of time to do that. Um, we saw you know, Ethereum, different style, every 12 seconds, so they're obviously running much, much faster. Okay, questions about these? Can those networks interact with each other? Uh, they can. So the question is, can those networks interact with each other? They can, but it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's not like fluent naturally built in. Um, there's no sort of like base level protocol. Do you need a third party or something? Yeah, this is, this is exactly where we're at now. So this is called interoperability. And if you want to send tokens from one to the other, so for example, you can get something called wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum, or you could also get Wrapped ether, wrapped ether on Algorand, so you can get your tokens on other chains. But yeah, you need some third party um, to bridge from one chain to the next. And this is, uh, in the past couple of years, this has been a hard problem. I say hard because um, it's resulted in hacks and lots of money being lost, lots of value being lost. So naturally, no, there's no interoperability. Um, the tokens are only designed for their network. Uh, and if you think about Bitcoin, you know, is it a, pro is it a problem, do I think? Uh, I think, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's just the, the way we are, right? There's lots of natural species in the wild. And I think that interoperability may be tricky, may be tough, but I don't think in the long run it matters. Um, I kind of have a multi-chain view of things, so I think we're going to see lots of chains, different uh, specific ones to do different things. And then if we need to do, if we need to hop from one to the next, we'll have to pay someone a fee to use their service uh, to do the bridging. Uh, and so bridging is still risky right now uh, because of security um, and basically um, what happens when you, when you bridge tokens is you have to so if I'm going from Algorand to Ethereum, I have to send my Algorand to a third party. They're going to hold my Algorand. They're going to mint some new tokens called wrapped algo, and they're going to send that to Ethereum. And now that third party is holding all the value that I sent to them originally. And so that's kind of like a honeypot. Uh, and like, like what, what do we do about that? Um, so I think over time, bridges are going to get better. Once we eliminate all the obvious holes and flaws, bridges will get better. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. You're, you're making a sacrifice there, yeah. And, and who knows, if you go through the wrong bridge, right, you might get flagged, you might get censored. How do you lose your money? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, like what you're, what you're doing there is uh, you're not maintaining control of your tokens. You're giving control to someone else, right? Because from their point of view, they're not going to let you have control and mint new tokens on a new chain because then they're on the hook for both batches. If I take mine back, now they're on the hook over here. Yeah, so you have to submit your control. You have to say, okay, you have right to use my Ether. And then the process in reverse is the same way. They have to burn tokens uh, and send them back to you. Yeah. When you ordered 
so the transition is to be called a blended number of chains. Yeah, I just mean that we need to know what block comes first, right? You have the hash pointers between the blocks, and we're not allowed to break them, and so that creates a total ordering. Uh, and if you think of the ATM transaction, first we need to debit my account, and then we need to issue the cash. So that maintains the total order. If there's a problem, you call the bank, right? but you can't call Bitcoin. So that's the total ordering of events. And then that's also like if you need to settle a dispute. Then you need to go back and look at the chain and say, well, what happened first? And this is what your, your node does when it validates, is it processes all the transactions all the way up to present moment. Okay, so if that kind of defines like our two main, our two by two main decisions that a blockchain needs, Uh, to do. Let's have a look at just some of the different consensus methods in the landscape and how they're different. And uh, I'm going to propose a way that we can organize them. So if we just look at, this is a survey I did looking at secondary research. So that means that if somebody just proposed a new idea on their blog post, it doesn't count. Somebody else has to evaluate it first. And if we look at the ranking here, proof of work dominates. Nobody mentions consensus without also mentioning proof of work. And then proof of stake. And then PBFT. The P is the practical uh, for an implementation of BFT. And then we have some others down here as well. Uh, the details aren't super important. But what we can see is a trend that sort of if we were to group all of these, they kind of go into the staking category. And so there's a lot more research into proof of stake. And research leads to ideas that get published. They don't necessarily lead to blockchains that work, but they lead to ways that people look at the characteristics and say, no, nah, I don't like that. I got a, uh, I got a way to fix it. Or um, maybe they look at it and they say, oh, let's get a, let's get a BFT style uh, in the top right quadrant there. Let's get one of those blockchains going. So proof of work, definitely the most popular. Proof of stake, though, has emerged in, uh, to take on a lot more research. So if we think about what these are doing here, I mentioned clock cycles right here for proof of work. So that's what I call the scarce resource. Now, it's not universally scarce because you can buy more processors and you can design better ones. And we've seen this happen. So it's, it's scarce in the sense that you're paying for uh, electricity and you have to pay for the electricity. But it's not universally scarce. Uh, and then what do we look at? The other one, proof of stake tokens, okay, also are not scarce. Uh, and in fact, tokens are, you know, can be generated at, at will. After clock cycles, bits came in and took over. Votes are kind of like tokens. And then I got two more here. So a short word about all of these. Clock cycles comes from SHA-256. And we've talked about this. Random output, quick to verify, impossible to reverse. And so clock cycles are scarce, like this computer, your phone, whatever. It has a max. Right, that you can get out of it in clock cycles. That's the scarcity. If you want more, you have to go out and use your labor and resources to get more. And so we've seen this evolution from CPUs to FPGAs, which are field programmable gate arrays, which are kind of just like um, kind of like DIY circuit boards. Uh, and from there, we've seen it go to graphics processing units that either come inside your PC or separately. Uh, and then from there, we've seen ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits. And so this, is, this evolution has actually is created like a, like a wedge going this way, where CPUs are general purpose computing, right? And then you get narrow and narrow, and ASICs are useless at anything else, anything else than the algorithm they're designed for. And so maybe that's not the evolution uh, that, that we were after. There's also like Moore's law at work here. 
So again, the scarcity is there, but it's not universally or ultimately scarce. So bits and memory hard functions, this is what Ethereum was running on, where you need access to disk or access to memory. Um, so algorithms such as proof of space or proof of retrievability are doing this type of thing, and there are blockchains um, that run these. So the algorithm that Ethereum used to run was ETHHash, and now you can still find it working, Ethereum Classic, and the newest one, Ethereum Proof of Work, which happened last year after the merge. If you want to think about value, you know, Ethereum is $1,800, ETC is maybe 20, ETH POW is maybe two. So we've lost two orders of magnitude and then a third order of magnitude when these networks have, have forked away. So another one is called Scrypt or Script. And this is what Litecoin and Dogecoin are using. So when they forked their code from Bitcoin, uh, they made minor tweaks and then published it. Litecoin's changes are like hilariously simple. Uh, there's like, instead of every 10 minutes, it's every two and a half minutes to like speed it up and, and change the algorithm and things like this. Um, but they need, uh, so I think you can use GPUs uh, to mine these, or there are now ASICs also, not now, like for a while, that can mine script. Okay, so those are kind of like computing resources. Then we get to tokens and votes. So tokens, you know, are a bit arbitrary. Uh, you can create a token real quick, uh, and you can, you know, uh, destroy a token just as quick if, if you have that built in. I mentioned PayPal, right? They can destroy your tokens, you know, just like that if they have your address and they don't, they don't, like the cut of your jib. Um, you know, money is also arbitrary, right? Money can be spent by the government at will when they decide that they need to, you know, build a tunnel. It's fine, we'll just, we'll print the money and figure it out later. Um, ether used to be inflationary. There's different characteristics there, right? But your tokens, uh, generally you want them tied to some value. Uh, and the most common value we have is money. I think there's a subtle distinction here between tokens and votes, but they kind of group together. So votes, again, we're thinking people sitting around the table. Um, so the voters should be known, or the votes should be known, meaning that you can account for all of them. Unlike Ethereum, where you're like, how many Ether were out there in total again? Um, they should be limited. So you're thinking like one processor, one vote, just like we think of one person, one vote. Uh, and then wh what's so special about a vote is that actually once you use it, it's not useful anymore. So you can use it and then the votes go away. Now in the next round for the next block, that's fine, you can vote again. Okay, so the votes are discarded and you shouldn't be able to like sell your votes. You know, maybe we can imagine some scenarios, but really your votes aren't useful anywhere, is that anywhere else. So again, these are, we're cr these, this is artificial scarcity that we're creating because people are playing by the rules. So it's not universally scarce. Uh, so this brings us to time and biology, right? This is the ultimate scarcity. Uh, definitely in terms of physics, uh, we're, thinking, we're thinking about time or maybe space time. Uh, in terms of humans, we're probably thinking about biology and our time or our lived experience, right? And so can we leverage this to then have that be the scarce resource to prevent civil resistance? in a blockchain system. And so I think this is, this is interesting. Okay, and so what have we seen people do with this? So, you know, human biology, this is what gives rise to the idea of CAPTCHAs. CAPTCHAs are evolving pretty quick these days with AI. They maybe aren't as useful as they were a few years ago. But the uh, completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart um, this is something that through our biology, we can look at a picture and say, that's a car, not an airplane, right? Or like, I've seen some, I've seen some weird ones lately. Like I saw one that was like, pick the impressionist oil paintings. And I, <laughs> I'm like not used to having to click on impressionist oil paintings, right? 
Uh, and so they're, they're getting a bit more strange. Um, but it's something that it takes us one or two seconds to do. And it would take a computer, you know, thinking large language models or something. You have to train the model, have the data set, have human reinforcement. So it's, it's hard, but not impossible for a computer to do. Um, and I think CAPTCHA is actually, for the computer that makes the CAPTCHA, the computer can solve it easily because it made the problem. It's like the teacher that wrote, posed the test. But for another computer that doesn't know, then it's difficult to solve. And so that leverages human biology. Um, in terms of time, POET is an algorithm, proof of elapsed time. And what we want to do here is if we think about probabilistic nature, where we don't know when the next block is coming, that can be very useful. Uh, so proof of elapsed, elapsed time, it's going to be a processor that can guarantee that it waits until it executes the next instruction. So I guess the way it works now is processors, they have a queue and they execute instructions as fast as they can, as long as they need to. Proof of elapsed time says, no, we're going to have a method that guarantees that processor had to wait X amount of time before delivering the result. So that means that you or the next block is also waiting to see that result. Uh, so this could be useful to leverage the time dimension. Uh, and then this has been news lately. This just came out two weeks ago, right? Uh, proof of personhood, they're calling it. These are WorldCoin iris scanning orbs. Uh, so that's, that's what they look like. And it's just that. It scans your iris, and it's going to create a biometric of your iris. And then it's going to assign that as an ID in the WorldCoin uh, database. Um, and so they're calling it proof of personhood, the idea being that you can only have one identity. Right? And so this kind of could make sense if we think about civil resistance. We guarantee that one person only has one identity, then, then that could be helpful. Um, now they don't have a, it's not a blockchain, it's running right now on Ethereum. Uh, but I mean, they have a lot of interesting tech going into this. Personally, I don't like the idea of uh, what, the way that they're bootstrapping the network is they're offering like 50 US dollars. So get your eyeball scanned and then you can redeem for WLD tokens in the network. Okay, so uh, yeah, I don't know, make, make what you will of that sort of, are you sacrificing your biometric ID to WorldCoin forever for $50? Is, is that the price? Um, people in India have also been gaming the system. So they go around and they, they, uh, they offer people in cash like $20 to do the scan. And then they themselves redeem the tokens. So you should have got $50, but now the person's only getting 20. So actually they've been shut down in a few countries. Um, just today, when I was doing this, I, uh, I don't know the country. It might have been Bangladesh uh, arrested some, some world coin orb operators. So, you know, wh where there's money involved, right, people are going to play. People are going to uh, do what they do. So it might be an interesting idea. Um, I won't be scanning my eyes anytime soon. Uh, the co-founder is Sam Altman. He's the chat GPT open AI guy. So... Um, there's a lot of you know, personal clout and money there behind it. OK, I think this is the last slide. So I, I wrote a taxonomy of these methods a few years back as part of my research. We can see here a lot of consensus methods listed on the left. And you know, proof of work here is Bitcoin right in the middle, and it's leveraging clock cycles. So to give us an idea, most of these are using votes. Even though they're distinct methods, they're using votes. And if we add tokens, you know, it's over half the list is using votes and tokens. The only one using clock cycles by itself is Bitcoin. Proof of memory leverages both bits and clock cycles. Proof of human work, we still don't see a blockchain using this, but who knows what could happen in the future. And so, you know, the idea of like doing stuff like this is to like organize and see if there's any obvious 
areas for, for development. Um, and we also get an idea if you look at the fault tolerance. Anything that's written like this is kind of like a BFT style system. And then anything with a percentage is more of a chain style system for the tolerance. So tokens and votes dominates. We haven't seen a lot about biology, but I think we'll see more and more as these systems get better. You know, right, about biometrics, right? Like Apple, they have your whole face ID supposedly securely stored on your phone, right? Um, and so they've put a lot of research into doing that and making it secure. And so like that's, that's one counter argument. You say, well, actually, my phone already has all my biometrics and, you know, Either we trust or we trust other people have verified that it's secure like they say. Um, and so apparently what the orbs do, it's just such an interesting blockchain story. Apparently what the orbs do is uh, as soon as they scan your iris, uh, right, like they do some hashing technique and they convert it right on the device. So if someone steals the orb, the original data is already gone. Um, and so then at that point, they could have access, like they could maybe know some like metadata. They would, they would see like some hashed value, but they wouldn't have whatever characteristics went into creating it. Um, and then those they're batch processed to Ethereum, and they also use some um, some cryptography, some zero knowledge proofs, which we might come back to. We might come back to this story when we talk about that in week seven or eight. Okay, so next up is blockchain scaling. So we're thinking like, how can we go from a small number of users to a giant number of users? And uh, we'll look at some of the scaling approaches. So I mentioned layer ones today. Layer twos are a scaling approach to blockchain and, uh, and so on and so forth from there. 